Okay, thanks for tuning in. Today we have Sam Robertson discussing the paper development of a skill acquisition periodization framework for high performance sports. So thanks for tuning in and thanks for joining us, Sam. Thanks for having me, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here. Nice, right, good to have you, mate. So just want to give us a little bit of a, an overview on the paper and then we'll kind of work down in a, in a backwards fashion like uh, like usual. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, as you, for those that have seen the paper already, you'll you'll understand this is an area that I suppose is is really um, pervasive in in high performance sport, particularly I think in team sport. Uh, but it's a, I guess, a, a combination or a culmination of of a number of years of Damien and, and myself, the the other author, really considering um, this notion of of skill acquisition and also skill learning and skill refinement in a, in elite sport and how we can. Uh, improve it by thinking a little bit more multidisciplinary. Um, and so, if if we go, if we start from, I, I guess, from the back, what we're really trying to to look at with this type of paper is that we're um, rather than taking a, a lot of the theoretical approaches that we've seen over the last thirty or forty years of, of research and uh, and looking at them in isolation, trying to combine them and 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 really, um, I guess, learning some lessons from what we've seen in the physical training literature around um, looking at how we prescribe, how we evaluate the, the learning implementations or the learning interventions we put in place in uh, elite sport uh, and doing it uh, in a really systematic uh, systematic fashion where we can actually, uh, I, I guess, bring in other disciplines like uh, analytics, like um, like physical training um, uh, to make more sense of, uh, of the type of data we're getting with respect to skill acquisition in sport. No, that's cool, mate. So you just want to, uh, like I mentioned, just just move down to the the kind of end and and move backwards. Would that be all right? Sure, sure. Perfect. So with respect to the paper, it, from a, a summary perspective, we've really pulled out these these areas um, that we see so often in in physical training, um, and in particular, there's been five that we've we've focused on in the paper, uh, and that's the specificity of of training that we undertake from a, a skill acquisition perspective, uh, how much progression is inherent in that training. Um, are we overloading uh, our athletes? Um, how reversible is the type of training that we we provide? And then also, are we giving them um, variety uh, in in the type of training that that we, we're providing with them in in a in an applied environment? And so, a lot of these questions that I suppose over time um, have been deemed as, as quite difficult to answer in the field. Um, we we kind of hope that this this model, this framework, will be used by people to. Uh, to start to answer some of these these questions, in particular from a longitudinal perspective, um, and so for example, we we really don't know much about how changing these types of parameters that I mentioned earlier, like the the load associated with skill training over time, we don't know how how that changes the, the way that an athlete uh, responds or any learner for that matter over over time. So, for example, the differences between doing really uh, a really condensed high volume, high intensity period of, of skill training versus a, a lower volume um, uh, intervention. We, we, we don't know a lot about that, particularly in elite environments. Um, we know very little about this kind of um, how reversible uh, our performance is from a skill perspective uh, during periods of, of limited or no training. And, that, and that's really important in, in sports where there's, there's really um, intense international schedules or competitions where, where athletes don't have the time or availability to, to spend large periods of time practicing. Um, of course, this idea of wearable technologies is so pervasive now in everything that we do in elite sport. Um, we're getting a lot of information relating to how an athlete performs from a skill perspective, not only in competition but also in training. Uh, which traditionally was really quite hard to do. We, the only way we could do that was through notation analysis. And uh, and so being able to harness these wearable technologies, we're able to uh, um, obtain this information in, in near real time. And, and that's opened up a whole um, world of possibilities with respect to how we can monitor and, and, and learn from this data. Um, and then a lot of other things that we've learned from, from physical training uh, in particular, um, and, and particularly the strength and conditioning literature, uh, we feel like we can... Uh, we've made a really good case in this in this paper for for picking up a lot of that and and staying to a, apply that in um, in the skill acquisition realm. Cool. So you just want to just take us, yeah, take us, yeah. Well, good. <laughs> if we talk about uh, the paper 
with respect to these these five characteristics I mentioned earlier around specificity, progression, overload, reversibility, and and what we've termed tedium, which is really um, interchangeable with, I suppose, variety. What we've done is uh, provide a, a background for each of these characteristics, um, provide some evidence for that for a, for a start from the existing skill acquisition literature. And so really in, in a nutshell, um, the paper is, is somewhat a, a review paper, but also in a, in a sense it's a stimulus paper where we've proposed a, f a few ideas, but also trying to get people to, um, uh, to pick up some of these ideas themselves and, and, and undertake some new original research. So the notion of specificity in, in skill acquisition is, a, is, is one that has a number of different theoretical frameworks already that are proposed. And we haven't gone into a lot of those in, in great detail here. Rather, we've, we've tried to provide a, um, uh, some examples of, of, of how we might um, assess specificity uh, in a more uh, systematic and a more, probably a more granular or a more accurate way in the field. And, and so... We've, we've, we've lent probably quite heavily on a, a constraints-led approach in this, um, which, which some of the listeners will be familiar with, particularly those that are, have a background in, um, in, in skill acquisition. And so a lot of these things, as I mentioned earlier, that we, we normally have to um, assess in training through manual notation, like um, if we say, for example, uh, we have a footballer passing the ball, a lot of the things that we would normally have to manually notate, such as um, the time that the player had in possession of the ball before passing, uh, the location on the field, uh, who they were passing to, these things are now starting to become almost automated in the way that we can collect those. And so uh, obtaining all of this information at once on, on a, uh, a given skilled behavior in training is, is quite, um, again, as I said earlier, can almost be done in real time now. And so by looking at the way that these, uh, the athlete responds to the combinations of these characteristics, that really starts to give us an idea about how specific our training is. And so a really, a really um, obvious example might be, for example, if we are um, uh, undertaking a lot, of, uh, a lot of passes at training where the, the player has provided a lot of time to get rid of the ball or to pass the ball to their opponent or their teammate, um, and we compare that with, with what we see in a game, which is quite a simple concept, and the two don't align really well, we know that our training is, is not particularly specific to the game. And that's, that's a fairly basic concept. So what we're proposing here is that we look at the combinations of these, of these different um, constraints or these different characteristics of training, um, which, which I mentioned earlier. I think probably one of the main reasons is people have struggled to, um, to progress this area is because it becomes quite complicated when we start to look at multiple characteristics of training at once. Um, we get this kind of exponential um, number of, uh, all this exponential growth in the number of combinations that we could, we could look at. So it's very easy to look at how someone um, uh, responds to certain types of pressure in isolation or to having a certain amount of time to pass the ball. When we start to look at combinations of those, um, the analysis required becomes quite complex, and and um, and certainly this is where some of the newer analysis techniques, in particular, say machine learning, can start to to help us look at patterns, and and that's really what it's about. We want to look at uh, pattern recognition and have a look at how the athlete responds to different combinations of these of these parameters. And so, if we move into say a a, a progression uh, as our second um, characteristic, I suppose here. What we're particularly looking for there is, um, is again, using the same type of data, so to speak, we want to look at, um, I guess, measuring this in, a, uh, in an applied sense. There's been some longitudinal work in the literature, and particularly in laboratory settings, where, um, where people are looking at the rates of learning of, uh, of athletes, and, and in particular, learners in general. But certainly in an applied sense, uh, there hasn't been a lot of work looking at um, I guess the volume and the intensity of, of training and how that changes the rate of progression uh, in athletes. And in fact, many people would argue in, in team sports, and I would probably be one of those people, that we don't really know how well athletes improve from a skilled behavior perspective once they actually come into a professional environment. And so in, in the sport I work with predominantly at the moment, Australian football, uh, we have a draft system like many of the US sports, um, but we don't actually have a lot of good information on whether a player improves their skill once they, they come to us um, as a professional. 
And so from a progression perspective, what we're trying to propose here is that by monitoring really simple things like uh, the number of passes that an athlete um, performs in a week, how difficult those passes are uh, and how well they performed, we can start to get a, an understanding of the relationship between those, those three characteristics. And by combining that information with um, the above-mentioned content I discussed around specificity, we get a really good understanding about not only um, the strengths and weaknesses of our players, but also uh, which combination is, is most uh, related or most linked to them um, seeing higher rates of, of skill development. And of course, we know once, once athletes start to get to a, um, a higher level of performance that those that rate of development or that, um, that rate of improvement is, is diminished. And so those really subtle changes in training um, can be really important to detect and make sure that um, we're getting the necessary response to ensure that the athlete is, um, is still either maintaining their performance or, or even improving um, if possible. From a third perspective, uh, we've, we've talked quite heavily about overload, which is a, a really interesting concept. Um, the, again, there's, there's work done uh, that has been undertaken in, in skill acquisition around um, uh, how an athlete feels from a being overloaded with respect to um, their environment and how that affects learning. Um, in this example, we were more interested in, in um, from a planning or a planning prescription um, perspective. So, for example, um, and I think of a sport such as golf would be a good example here, which again is another sport I've worked on, uh, worked in in the past, where players uh, are regularly on tour internationally, away from coaches, away from support staff. Um, if we could potentially overload uh, an athlete or a golfer for a, a short period of time, let's say for a month, with some extremely high volume training. Um, how will that flow onto their performance over the next three to four months while they're away on tour? These are the types of questions that, that, that by assessing overload and evaluating overload in a, a systematic fashion uh, or systematic manner, we can actually start to answer some of these questions. Um, and so when we look at the heart of this paper around um, uh, this term periodization um, from a skill acquisition perspective, that's really what we're talking about. Um, a, can we actually overload that athlete in a, at a single time point or a, or a more acute time point and, and get a necessary, um, I guess, performance response or a learning response? And these are questions that we, we, we don't know the answers to at the moment. And then, of course, the, th the fourth um, characteristic there is reversibility. And it's obviously um, really well linked with overload as well that once we take away that stimulus, um, how long does it take for the uh, the athlete or the or the, the player in, in the golf example to become detrained and and obviously these are questions that have been asked um, when we bring it back to the skill uh, sorry to the physical training uh, literature that have been asked and answered um, you know quite extensively in in that in that domain uh, but not so much in in skill learning so we, we don't know whether there's a drop off um, in, in that performance and and um, but again it's something that if we implement this framework um, we would like to see people pick this up across multiple sports and start to answer uh, answer that question. And, and the fifth and final component of, of the uh, of the framework is is around tedium or, or variety. And this is probably the, the the one area of the five that has seen the most um, I guess research in in, in skill acquisition. Uh, and that really relates to um, how by adding variety in in the types of skill training that an athlete is doing. And also the the contextual information they're taking on board during those activities. How does that change um, the uh, the response of the athlete with respect to the learning and also performance? And so a lot of uh, a lot of listeners that are I guess familiar with this area, we um, familiar with contextual interference as an example of this, uh, and and just a variation in, in in training prescription. Full stop. And so. Here we've, we've provided an example of um, by by changing the the stimulus, I suppose, that it's exposed to an athlete, um, and measuring that in a really systematic fashion. We can start to get a really good understanding about how each individual athlete um, should be treated with respect to this. So um, I mentioned earlier with specificity, do we want something that's very game-like? Um, most people are, uh, would suggest yes. We always want something like that, but. Um, in, in training for learners or for, for really for novice performers, for example, um, something that is a bit more controlled, 
um, with a few less constraints on the performer can be can be quite useful. Um, another example might be around the, the cognitive effort or the cognitive load that's actually um, exhibited by the performer as, as a, I guess, a feedback mechanism in, in that respect. So, for example, um, if an athlete is already finding um, a task very difficult, then there's no need to make that um, that task more represent- representative or more specific to, to a game-like situation. And again, some listeners will be familiar with the, the empirical support around that, um, around some of Mark Watanoli's work in, in the challenge point, um, with the challenge point theory. Um, and so, again, there's a number of different um, uh, theoretical frameworks where we can we can draw upon to provide evidence for the amount of variety or that um, that we provide an athlete in uh, in training. This article is more around providing a framework where people can measure and and um, record that data. And um, I, and I guess if we're summarising the five altogether, the, the take home message should be that by evaluating this information um, by well sorry by carefully um, collecting this information allows us to evaluate. Um, the efficacy of our programs in a little bit more um, a systematic uh, manner than has been done previously in skill acquisition. No, that's great, mate. My my next question was going to be uh, key take homes, but you've kind of you've covered that box already, so that's great. Um, where can people uh, where can people get the paper? Firstly, and secondly, um, you kind of share you share this on Twitter and uh, and obviously share other people's work as well. Where can people find you? Yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter and and uh, I obviously disseminate most of my work and as well as some other people's work which I, I find interesting or find useful to the field. Um, so my my Twitter handle is at Robertson underscore uh, S uh, capital S J uh, for Samuel John. Uh, and again, this this article was published in in Sports Medicine, so unfortunately it's not an open journal. Uh, but again, it, it is in um, if, if, if participants or listeners are, are interested in, in getting a copy, certainly they can um, look me up or, or contact me through Twitter and I'm, I'm happy to pass pass one on. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot for your time, Sam. Uh, really appreciate it. And I'll, um, I'll let you get on with what sounds like a very busy day. Thanks, Rob. Thanks again for having me. Thanks, mate. No problem.